Welcome to another episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener. On Outliers, we decode what the top 1% of performers across industries have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, we dive deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. And today we're talking with Pete Richardson. Pete is the co-founder of the Patterson Center, and over the last 20 years, they've helped thousands of people put together a holistic plan for their lives. They do this through a process called Life Plan, and that includes spending two full days with a facilitator who takes you through exercise after exercise to help you appreciate your past, understand your unique strengths, and put together a holistic plan for the future, one that integrates all areas of your life. And Pete has helped nearly a thousand people through the Life Plan process. After working with him in 2019 and going through the process myself, I knew that I needed to have Pete on the show. In this episode, we go deep on how to create a vision for your life, the importance of perspective and reflection, and why we all need our own replenishment cycle. Pete has a wealth of wisdom, and I was lucky enough to get him on the show, so please enjoy this conversation with Pete Richardson. Pete, it is a huge honor to have you on the podcast, and there's so much that I'm super excited to jump into, so I'm going to try to pack as much as possible into the next hour and a half of our conversation, but thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Outliers. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be with you, and yeah, I'm excited for the conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for making the time. So we'll set up a little bit of context and there's a lot to get into there. But where I wanted to start is if you can just help at a high level frame up what the Patterson Center is and the problems that you've been focusing on and what you've been working on for the past few decades. Yeah, good. I'd be happy to do my best to to give a high level overview of that. So the Patterson Center is named after Tom Patterson, who passed at age 94 last fall. And there's a significant backstory on him for sure, but we named it after him and his life work of over 50 years of process design and his passion and sense of life purpose and calling to help organizations and leaders gain clarity and insight into the reason and purpose for their existence. So the assumption there is, that we're not here randomly by accident, that we're actually, we're breathing and living and existing for some kind of meaningful contribution to the world around us. And so we consider ourselves at Patterson, a group of facilitators and guides who help people discover that reason for existing. And so what's the option? The option would be, you know, if you've read some of the existentialists in human history, the way I see it is there's at least two different significant pathways a person can travel. One would be one of existential confusion, existential, perhaps in the worst cases, despair and hopelessness and meaninglessness. And unfortunately, too many people live their lives and go to the grave with that being their reality. And so we believe that there's an option of existential discovery and existential clarity and existential hope and meaning. In addition to Tom Patterson, I've been significantly influenced over the years by Viktor Frankl, who was a Jewish psychiatrist who survived the horrors of World War II concentration camps. And he writes extensively about this. He called it logotherapy. And and the sort of the the Socratic process of discovery, of discovering why you're alive and living for a higher meaning than even what's before you in some cases, which may be very dark and hopeless. So we at Patterson engage leaders. We engage oftentimes our organizations and we take them through Socratic processes. What does that mean? It means that asking thoughtful existential questions in guided process, using different constructs and tools to excavate and really hopefully flesh out and make visible truth. And the assumption there is, well, once I see the truth of why I'm here, then I can decide how I'm going to responsibly sort of cultivate that truth, nourish that truth, bring it to its full expression in the world over a lifetime from birth to death. 
I think it would be great if we could spend a little bit of time on the Patterson process and then work our way into talking about what the life plan is and, and how that's different than the strat op work that you do more with companies. But you have a, you know, a fascinating concept about spiraling a problem in order to get perspective on it and how and where that takes you and, and how you ultimately get to a point of clarity. Would you mind just sharing a little bit of that framework? Yeah, sure. So it's actually that framework is core to Tom's process design. It's rooted and founded in that sort of Socratic process of guiding someone to self-discovery. So the principle is this, get perspective before you plan. Gain clarity before you decide strategically what to do. And the assumption is we don't know what we don't know until we see it. So Tom spent in the 80s a significant time traveling between the States and China, commissioned under President Reagan's administration with guys like Peter Drucker and Deming and other like top like American consultants, helping Chinese economic leaders engage, understand the global economy. And what Tom, Tom fell in love with Chinese culture and people, but he also saw how they profoundly think and process differently than we do. So if you can imagine two dots, like one on the left and another on the right, and the one on the left is called problem, and the one on the right is called solution, the American approach sort of mindset-wise is a straight arrow from the problem to the solution. And you could say very speed-driven. So like, just get her done, like, like make it happen, right? And that's not all bad. I mean, we get things done compared to much of the world fast. But we also run a high degree of risk in having an impartial outcome or solution. What Tom discovered in China was not a straight line between problem and solution. Same two dots left to right. But as you go left to right, trying to find the elusive solution, the Chinese or Asian Eastern mindset way is to circle it around and around and around like a spiral. And if you flip that spiral three-dimensionally, it's like a cone ascending up. We call that the apex of clarity. And so what that means in China is if like you're negotiating a contract with the manufacturer, you may think you're at the solution, but you're way back here somewhere in this spiral. And next time you talk, you know, you're seeing this thing from a different vantage point and you may be thinking, wait, they just flipped on us. And then the next time it's a different vantage point. Well, what they're doing is ascending up this cone or apex of clarity. And so Tom has designed philosophically and in process design his his life plan and strategic systems or processes around that philosophy. And so we have, unlike other strategic processes, we spend a heavy amount of time in perspective, gaining clarity. And in life planning, like we did with you, you know, we spent almost a day and a half just getting perspective. And when you when that truth and clarity becomes visible, it's like, wow, the plan almost writes itself because we've connected all these perspective dots and now we see what we didn't see before. The fog is cleared out of our brains mm-hmm. and thinking. And now we see, ah, that's it. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm alive. That's what I want to do with that. So does that make sense? No, that, uh, that makes sense. That's a wonderful encapsulation. And no, I think just to reiterate what you said, what I found remarkable about going through the life plan process, and it is exactly like you say, and I think the things that stood out to me were one, none of us as adults get that experience to be able to go back and rewind it a little bit to learn more about ourselves and, and just have more time to reflect. But it, it felt like, yeah, a big part of the process was extremely heavy on reflection. And, you know, maybe the way I would reiterate what you were just talking about of kind of that process of circling is by circling enough, by reflecting enough, the answer comes. And the answer then is incredibly intuitive and it's something that you're very bought into. Is that that's your experience working with people through that process? Absolutely. You know, and and I've been at this for almost 30 years now, this life work. And it really is sort of my sense of contribution and life purpose in the world as I see it, helping others gain this kind of clarity. Mm -hmm. And of over the 1,000 people I've taken through these multi-day sessions in 28 years, you see common themes for sure, but not one of those lives is exactly alike. 
but you do see themes and you can, as a guide and facilitator in my chair, I, I can kind of see at times where things are headed, but I dare not say that. Like I, I've learned over the years to like withhold my perspective or withhold my point of view and wait for a person to self-discover that. Because that's where it's like fully owned. And it's not my it's not mine to tell, really. It's mine to guide mm-hmm. and it's theirs to discover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're almost like a like a Sherpa in that way. You're guiding people on the on the journey. You've been there before. You maybe know where it leads, but you're there as uh almost like a neutral intermediary <laughs> to help people go through that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully you want a guide who's traveled the trail before, you know, and, and in this case, the trail is simply process. So early on as a life plan facilitator, you know, I, I would lose sleep and on nights and because, because I'm like, I don't know where this is going. Well, the truth is I don't have to know where it's mm-hmm. going, but I have to know how the process yeah. goes. And I have to trust the process. So Tom always used to say, trust the process, but trust the process. You must trust the process. It's still to this day, I'm amazed at the process itself. And it's like, this, this process really works. Yeah. You know, he, he was, he used his talent to design something that, that really does work. Can you encapsulate what at the end of the day is so different about going through this process as opposed to another kind of say life coaching process? Yeah, so I, I'm not maybe schooled in all the different other life coaching processes, but I, I do know this work for sure. And so one unique feature, as I did mention before, is the, um, the conviction and the amount of time we spend on gaining clarity and leading one someone to self-discovery of truth. So is life planning for everyone at any given time? No, it's not. In fact, we have our own screening process to see if somebody is ripe for it. So what do I mean by that? It's like life has inherently built into it from birth to death, its own ups and downs, its mountaintop valleys, valley experiences, seasons of great advance and triumph and celebration and seasons of great felt darkness and suffering and loss. It's just a part of the human journey. And everything in between. Life is built like a, almost like a good movie with a screenplay or an autobiography with its outline of life. There's chapters to life. And those chapters are defined oftentimes by events that in some form or fashion change us for good or bad, change the trajectory we're on, the pathway we're on. We call those turning points. And when someone is in a turning point, they're oftentimes very ripe for a life plan deep dive. Now, beyond turning points that come to us through the life journey, there's also turning points built in the seasons into the seasons of life. You know, I'm 57. I'm headed into what some would call the winter season of life. You're in the summer season of life. You know, it's just a different season. And I can't live at age 57 the way I lived at age 37 or 27, obviously. But my purpose in life is still relevant and still the North Star by which I'm trying to live out. But how that's lived out, how that's applied in this season is different. So when someone goes through the change of seasons in life, that's a good time to do a life plan. Now, if someone has just maybe gone through the death of a child or spouse or a painful divorce or some other like cataclysmic loss, we will oftentimes say, you know what, let's give this six months, maybe 12 months Mm -hmm. and revisit the conversation because you will see very differently over time. Mm -hmm. But right now that you need to like address that moment. So that's different in life planning. We want to make sure someone really is at a right place in life and asking the right questions about their own life story mm-hmm. before we dive into these things. And, you know, I've, I've had over the years, like, like a, a dad or a, a mentor, like almost force someone to come to a life plan and sponsor it, right? Pay for it. And only to realize 
this they should not be doing this right now. They personally are not at a place where they'll gain the benefit from this. So we want to make sure someone's in the right space and place to do this. And then we can dive in and address mm -hmm. where they're at. But I, I, I always want to know, like, what questions are you asking yourself? Like, like what is like waking you up at night? Where, where does your thinking drift throughout the day? What are some of the, the core questions you have about where you're headed and how you got to where you're at? And listening to those replies, I can discern like, okay, you're ready or you're not. So maybe to share a little bit of the backstory, I had uh, multiple people that I knew go through the life planning process, have very different experiences. One had a super emotional experience where they broke down and their kind of feedback to me was, <laughs> you should get a hotel room, you should plan to decompress each night after the life plan because it's a lot, you know, that excavation process I know for some people can be super emotional. And, you know, and then the other perspective that I got was just that it was amazing. And if you at all, if you feel that you're being pulled in some direction or directions, but you also feel that there's this general fog around everything and you just can't seem to see clearly that that's another reason to go for a life plan process. And that was what I identified with was in, in my sense, it was, I feel I have a pretty clear sense of where I want to head, but I also just feel like everything's a little bit foggy. And, and, but is that, can you talk a little bit about how different people experience that process? And I'm sure some have very emotional experiences, some it's not, but what that range looks like. Yeah, there is a range for sure. And maybe somewhere on that spectrum of range would be somebody like you just referenced for yourself that I just feel clouds in my, between my ears, mm -hmm. there's fog in my head. And I can't see very far out, you know, that the headlights of my life are not shining very far out. And so whatever like metaphor you use there, but, and so in that case, the light plan process brings clarity and it sort of dissipates that fog. And now I see what I didn't see before. And oftentimes that's vocationally driven. Like I don't like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm I'm built or I'm made for something more or different. And so the range there would be like someone is just their core talents are not being really tapped into in their current vocational place or role. Yeah. You know, why do over 72% of Americans hate or dislike their job, their place of employment? Why is that? Well, if you do a root cause analysis of that, oftentimes it's because what they're really gifted to do, that, that's not even desire or ex expectation of application by their employer. So they're showing up every day being asked to do things they're not even gifted to do. Mm -hmm. That's a bummer. I mean, that creates a sense of like just despair, vocational despair. So, and there's other reasons too, but that's a main one. So oftentimes vocational confusion will drive someone to us at Patterson Center. And oftentimes people feel like something's wrong with me. Like, this is a great company. This is a great organization, great culture. I should be happy here. Well, nothing's wrong with them, though they feel like there might be. They're just, they're on the wrong seat in the bus. And they're, who they are and all that they embody and their gift set, how they're hardwired, their place of high contribution is not aligning with their current role. So they can either like from clarity gained, like redeploy within that organization, if that's an option, mm -hmm. or like leave with respect and not burn the bridge and go somewhere else where there's a good match. So that, that's, that's a big one. I mean, people oftentimes come and they're there on the spectrum. Another place would be where they're just bored. Someone's just bored. Like it's no spark. Yeah. Like, I did what I set out to do and the vision I had has become reality. And now I've reached a place of stagnant stagnation and I don't know what's next. Like I need fresh vision. Like a wise man, much wiser than me said, where there's no vision, the heart grows weary, you know? And so if there's not a compelling, like imagine future for your life story, you know, the, you just kind of shrink inside. And, and that's the case oftentimes of people who come to us and they need, they need that clarity of like, what's next. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes those people are like entrepreneurial bent 
kind of like you, yes. right? They're the, the they're the conceiver. They're the they're the person who's designing and starting. And you know, imagine if everything Daniel you have in your head and all that you have in your design gift set was like now real up and going, right? And there wasn't a new like vision of design for the future. You just go, Ugh, right? And oftentimes people feel that way. So this can give them that what's next um, thing. Other people on that spectrum, you know, they're doing a lot of great stuff, but the domains of their life are not healthily integrated for the season of life they're in. Because life is not all about work. And I would suggest that someone's life purpose or sense of calling in life must transcend their vocational life. Now, certainly the clarity of calling or purpose helps define your vocational focus. But it should also be applied to your personal life, how you care for this gift of a body, mind, emotional, like soul, spirit, how that applies to your family, if you have a family, to your marriage, if you're married, to your kids, if you have kids, how it applies to your circle of friendships, how it gives back to your your community, however you define that. So it's not just about work. And oftentimes people have not like, connected those domains in life so i don't like life balance the the term life balance because that applies equal weightedness quantitatively and it's never equally weighted i like healthy life integration so i'm an empty nest now i'm a grandpa you know i have two granddaughters and two more grandkids on the way and very different season my capacity is different than when we're raising kids so the integration between work and my marriage and my kids and grandkids, it's a different composition than it was when I was in my 30s. So oftentimes people need that, like, how do I integrate all this? I don't have the bandwidth or capacity to do all mm-hmm. this. What do I say yes to? What do I say no to? I've got this landscape of opportunity and it feels like it's suffocating me because it's so much. It's like the it's like the menu at Cheesecake Factory, which we don't go there, but Janet's dad used to love to go there. It's like a it's like a catalog. And it's paralyzing because there's so many pictures and options. And that's how life can feel sometimes. So Tom Patterson, great quote. Tom has a lot of, we call them Tomisms. He said, success is not unlimited opportunity, but focused possibility. So oftentimes people need to look at the, the landscape of opportunity and they need help sifting through that and deciding what to leverage, what to focus on, what to say no to, what to say yes to. So those are a few of the, that talk about the spectrum. That's you know, an amazing kind of encapsulation of what that looks like. So what I want to try to do is pull a couple of these threads together and then we can dive into what that life plan process looks like. So, you know, your process is pretty heavy on reflection and it's not linear. It's very much about just kind of orbiting your life in the different seasons of your life and what you've done to date and where you feel drawn. It's about holistic integration. So assessing how you're doing in all of those areas of life, not just focusing professionally, which is another thing I found amazing because, you know, in my experience, a lot of the most successful people that I know don't need more time and attention and focus on their work. They, they need more time and attention and focus on all the other parts of their life and how they integrate those things really healthily. And then another thing is a lot of it as well was just assessing what you feel drawn to, the way that you think and kind of how you are as a person, how you show up in the world, and also how you can continue to kind of rejuvenate yourself. So, you know, maybe that sets up, that gives us a few things to to jump off into. But at a high level, so thinking super, super high level, how do you loosely kind of chop up and define what that life plan process is and what that looks like? And, and how do you tee that up for somebody of what they're going to go through? So uh, again, it's built on these existential questions. So in the perspective phase, and as you said, it's heavily weighted in perspective and gaining clarity. We spend significant time asking the question, how did I get to where I'm at? And then that's like a, as you experience, it's like a four hour conversation Mm -hmm. with multiple pieces to that. But when it's all said and done, your whole life backstory is visibly up on these huge charts. 
And it's like, that's how I got to where I'm at today from like my earliest years as a kid to where I am now. And we call that the turning point storyline. No one in human history, no one now and no one in the future will ever have that same story that you have. So for good or bad, that's my story. And what will I carry forward? And what will I leave behind? That's a good conversation. So when I see how I got to where I'm at through my story, a lot of times that can be emotional for people. It's like, wow, I had no idea that those forces way back years ago are playing a role in how I think and live today for good or bad. But there's also a lot of gratitude in that perspective. It's like, wow, even what I saw as the darkest valleys of my life there was always an upslope afterwards. There was always the gift of a person who came into my journey and like played a role in my development, those kinds of discoveries. And as a facilitator, what I see in all that is I begin to see the hints of giftedness, of talents, of passions, of value systems. And then we can almost like get real creative and say, well, that's your movie. That's your one of a kind movie. If the sequel to this movie were to come out, what do you think it would depict? So we don't go into backstory to to stay stuck in history. We go into backstory to learn from it. So we see what we want to carry forward. So that's a big question. How How did I get to where I'm at? Then there's a question like, where am I now? Like, okay, that's how I got here, but where am I now? So listeners could ask these four questions. We call it the four helpful list. They could ask right now in my life, personally, in my family, in my vocation or work, and in my community, what is right? Like, just what's right? It may not need to be perfect, but it's right enough to be right. It may need to be optimized, but what's right? Just make a list of everything that's right. And then number two, ask the question, what's wrong? Like, it really should be right, and it needs to be changed. I don't have to solve it right now, but let's make what's wrong visible. Be honest. Be true. Three, What's confused? Like, it needs clarification of some kind. I don't know if it's right or wrong, confused or missing or whatever. It's just like, it's there's fog around it. And then lastly, what's missing? Something that needs to be added. It's a felt void. So just asking those four questions. You can do that in a coffee shop on a piece of paper and gain great clarity, right? So that's another key question. Not just how did I get to where I'm at, but where am I now? So that's a part of perspective. And then we get into this whole thing like, what are my core talents? The assumption there is that everybody in the world has three to five core talents. Now, David Thoreau said this. He was an existential philosopher in the 1800s. You know, he said, the mass of mankind lead lives of quiet desperation and die with the song still in their heart. That's a sad statement. And I think it still, unfortunately, applies to every generation. So it doesn't have to be that way. So, so what does that mean? It means like, wow, I have, I have like natural talent. Like think about athletics. You know, that a young kid shows up on the ball field with incredible speed or athleticism or hand-eye coordination. Or think about someone at a young child at a piano who can hear something and play it or think about someone with mathematics who just has the ability with numbers or someone with language who has the ability with words. Where did this stuff come from? Well, that's a, that's a good conversation, but they have it. It's like they're born with it. So, so we've got to go through a process like what are my born with natural talents? Uh, Because that's what I want to leverage. That's what I want to spend decades investing in and cultivating. Talent neglected stagnates. So just because I have the talent doesn't mean it's going to have its full expression. So it's like in sports, you can have a kid who's naturally talented, but doesn't put in the discipline of hard practice and hard work. And another kid who's less talented, but works really hard, they can leapfrog him on the depth chart, you know? So, so talent must be identified and then it must be cultivated. And and oftentimes this takes years 
years to cultivate and invest in and grow and bring into its full expression. So we spend time identifying those core talents. And then, then we get into, all right, because the premise here is that my talents are moved by my heart to apply them in the world in a meaningful way. So the, the premise is the heart points the way. It's the compass. What do I mean by heart? Not your physical pumping heart, but your like invisible heart where your passions reside, where your desires reside. Sometimes those are burdens for the world. Like you see something that's wrong in the world and you have a burden to like address it, to bring some kind of healthy response to it, to fix it or to restore it. And that's where it gets messy. The heart's where it gets messy. Because all of us, if, if you've read The Psychologist of, you know, most would say there's a true self, soft, false self, there's a genuine self no, uh, and shadow side to our makeup, right? I don't want to talk to the shadow self because it has its own selfish, like self-absorbed, narcissistic like stuff. I want to talk to that true self and see where the true self is passionate to apply those talents. Now we're getting insight into life purpose. Like, ah, that's why I exist. I exist to take these talents and apply them here. So we have to go through a discovery process of what's the talent, what's the heart. We go through a number of questions like, where's my high contribution zone? Like, where's my sweet spot? Because most people have experienced what life is like when they're not living in their sweet spot. That's where you get bored. That's where you can feel depressed. That's where you can get angry at life. You can get really discouraged. I'm not making a difference. I'm spinning my wheels. So we go through a process like, where is your so-called sweet spot? And then how are you hardwired? Like, you know, there's a lot of personality profiles out there. We have our own approach to that, but it's integrated into all this other perspective. Like, what's my internal wiring? And how does that inform what I should and shouldn't do? What's my value system? What do I really value? How I think, live, and relate? And how does that inform what I say yes and no to? So we go through that process. And then you might remember on the personal life domain space, like how do I cultivate healthy energy physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? And when I say spiritually, not religiously, like where my core values are, right? So Peter Drucker said, great leaders lead themselves really well. Like they manage themselves really well. And that's usually way behind the scenes. It's like Winston Churchill. He used to go for a walk every evening with his cigar, drove the Secret Service nuts. What was he doing? He was processing the day. He was thinking out loud. He was reflecting. He was refueling. So what do I need to do to like make sure I have enough gas in my gas tank? So that as I engage the other domains of life, I'm well engaged, I'm healthily engaged, and I have the productivity and creative energy to do it. So we go through all that, all of that and more, and that's all perspective. Mm -hmm. So now once we've done all that, we can get, we can converge all that into statements of clarity around purpose. And this is where it gets fun. When I'm clear on my creative purpose, like why I'm here. Then I can imagine that forward into time and space. And that's where I can create a vision statement, a word picture that's rooted in truth. If someone says they want to do something and you think they're like smoking something they shouldn't be smoking, we call that a delusion. But when a vision for the future is rooted in the truth of purpose, let's go do it. Let's go build it. And that's where over time, what we envisioned or imagined becomes a reality that we're living in. And once we see that, then we can ask, okay, what are the strategic steps I make on the chessboard of life that I must make to move in that direction? And when I get the strategies right, then all the tactics flow out of that. And now I build the plan. Yeah, it was a, no, it's amazing just listening to you go through that because I'm sure for anyone listening, they're like, wow, that was a, that's a ton of amazing stuff, but no way you can do that in two days. But no, you absolutely do. We went through all of those as individual exercises. And the two things that were coming to mind as you were walking through that is in a lot of ways, I think part of it in, is you're shedding all these borrowed ideas because you know so much of what you were talking about there is 
really one, understanding yourself really, really well, what you're inclined to do, what you care deeply about doing, which may be another way of saying that is what you have enough intense passion and energy to actually go and apply yourself towards. And then what you're meant to do and what you're meant to do next and what feels right for you at this phase in your life and season of your life. And so in some ways, it's kind of shedding borrowed ideas and just getting really rooted again, which is I left the two days feeling more rooted than I've ever felt. in you know, I think to that point in my life, but then the other pieces, it's almost like you're taking a laser beam and you're just putting, you're tightening the scope of it in until it's crystal clear. You have tons of clarity of exactly where you're going and you've got the energy. You've been reconnected with your values. I wanted to maybe go back and go a little bit deeper into two things you said there. And I think one was when you were talking about working with someone on identifying your talents, I've always felt fortunate in my life that really early on in life, I kind of stumbled into that and found these things that I just have, can feel like I can have a lifelong passion towards. But I know that not everybody feels that. And I'm sure for some people listening, they think, well, yeah, but I, I don't relate to that baseball analogy. I'm not naturally fast. I'm not muscular. So for someone that has maybe has a hard time identifying those talents, what does that process look like? How do you work with them to figure that out? Yeah, again, it's, it's rooted in and getting perspective. So we have all these questions we ask to that we call them clues. Like and so as a guide, I ask the questions and pull out the data. And I'm on a treasure hunt for talent. So let me give you some examples. Like if I ask you or someone listening, like write down what you absolutely love to do. It can be work related, hobby related. It doesn't matter. Just write write it down. It's a clue. And then it's a clue. And now don't just say, oh, I love the outdoors. Okay, well, I would ask follow-up questions. Well, what do you like to do in the outdoors? I like to go to the mountains. Okay, what do you like to do in the mountains? Winter, summer, all seasons? So those are clues. Something about me is in that. And that's going to be supported by other clues. I may ask, here's another clue category for talent discovery. What drives you? Like, what motivates you? What moves you even un- unconsciously to move in life? Some are moving to move to solve problems. Like, they are just, they love walking into a room where there's a good problem to identify, begin to break down into pieces, and figure out how to like resolve it, either completely deconstruct it and rebuild it or do a root cause analysis and figure out where a system is broken. So that's a gift set. You, if I remember right, Daniel, you are driven to like design things, right? Yes. Like you love to design. And so what does that mean? You have a gift to like see a void, see something that doesn't exist. And then design something to fill that void. Or maybe you see a problem and you don't. And what you see is, is how we can creatively address it and meet that felt need. That's a gift. Not everyone has that. So that's simply a clue. Mm -hmm. Here's another clue. It's like I could ask someone, like, I want to know what you can't help but think about. Great question. We We call that an obsession. Like not a dark obsession, but like. What are you obsessed with? Like, you can't shake it. Whether you're on the beach in Hawaii on vacation or you're under pressure in the front range here at work, you like driving in your car, you just, you go there. You can't help but not think about it. That's a clue, right? I could ask you the question, like, if I were to go interview people who know you really well and say, hey, give me a handful of words to describe Daniel. Well, what you think they would say about you is a clue to me, right? I could ask you another clue question, like what do you yearn for and long for in the future? As you imagine forward, however long you live, none of, no, none of us know how long we're going to live, but let's say, you know, a full life, there are things that if you did not do or become in that period of time, you would really regret it. Like I missed it. Back to that David Thoreau quote. Yeah, the, the, the clutter of life swallowed up all the, the airtime in my life. And I missed the big rocks. I didn't identify those. Those are clues for me 
on the treasure of town. So I could give you more, but those are some of them. No, that's, no, that's perfect. Yeah, because, you know, it sounds very much like a process of triangulation. So if, you're, if it doesn't, if your talents aren't jumping out to you, then you clearly, everybody has talents. And that could be things that, like you said, you're drawn towards, things that you can't help but think about. Another great question that I've heard asked a lot of the time that I find really insightful is, what do you do that you find easy that other people find really difficult? You know, that's, an, that's another one. It's a great question, right? So one of the things you touched on that I'd love to just elaborate a little bit is, so something that keeps bubbling up in the conversation, something that I really connected with when we worked together and, and going through the process was you're approaching this problem from, from you know, you're using both sides of your brain, maybe for lack of a better word, or both sides of your being. And, and one of those is you're clearly deconstructing things. And so you're using that rational part of your brain to think about what that what to take from the history, where you want to be headed and strategy. And clearly a lot of that, I think you're using those rational skill sets. But then the other thing is you're also integrating that with the emotional side of your being. So what are you drawn towards? What are you repelled by? How do you think about that interplay in someone's life? Like, do those things need to come together? Are those things constantly battling one another? How do you think that the emotional side of somebody and the rational side of somebody needs to kind of connect or relate to one another? Well, if we're both committed to like, as honestly as we possibly can, engage truth, whatever that means in my backstory, where I'm at now, what I desire for the future, then that will be a mixture of conscious mental analysis and deep emotional reality. So they are intertwined like a bowl of spaghetti, you know, And that's why, you know, some people who like never cry will experience a deep emotional release in the life plan process. And I don't ever try to like make that happen. If it happens, it happens. And if it does happen, you just let it be. It it is what it is. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But the emotional side of it is critical that I am honest, like completely truthful and transparent about what I'm feeling about where I am, where I've been, and where I want to go. And those feelings are as as real as the the mental cognitive part of my life analysis. There's truth in that emotion. There's truth in the emotion. And, you know, we also do this thing called couple life plans, which is a three-day process where both spouses in the marriage are getting individual and then integrated perspective and clarity. And in those cases, oftentimes the emotional part is even amped up even more. So now what we don't want is to turn those three days into marriage therapy because that's not the design for that. But oftentimes those couples leave and they say, that was the best marriage therapy we ever had because I now see not just what I knew you were good at, for example, but I now see the deep emotional realities of what you feel. I now understand your uniqueness more than I ever knew before. I didn't even know some of those chapters in your backstory, let alone what is embedded in desires for the future in your deep in your heart. So the emotional part is, is very real. And for me personally, I think engaging all these life stories, it's made me, you know, we men in general are not as in touch with our emotional side of life as, as women. Those are general stereotypes and not all men and not all women, but you get it. And for me, I've become very comfortable and very friendly with my emotional world on day in and day out, whatever it is. And I think it's, it's really aided my marriage. We just celebrated 35 years of marriage. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You know, part of that is I think over the years I've become more comfortable and more honest and aware and able to express like what I'm feeling in a moment. And that's important. Now, I don't think feelings like dictate, should dictate like major life decisions and directions. But if you don't acknowledge them, they can subconsciously dictate those things. Yeah, and it's an ingredient not to ignore, 
but to mine and understand and get in touch with and then to, to figure out how to use. And I know that you're a prolific reader and I want to try to explore a little bit of maybe some of the books that you think about that are related, some of the books that have had special significance in your life. But one on that topic that I read recently that I think echoes a lot of what you just said is The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Have you heard of that book? I have not, but I like that title. It's awesome. It's a wonderful title. And yeah, the one of the stories in the book was about, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll try my best to get the spirit of it right. I think they were out on some sort of an, an expedition with some guides and they were trying to cover as much ground as possible. And so they got through the end of a day and everyone was exhausted. And so they rested for the night and the next morning they get up and they think, okay, well, let's go. We've got the rest of the journey to, you know, ahead of us, let's get moving. And they couldn't get anyone, any of the local guides to move. And they were asking them, you know, why, why don't you want to move? And one of kind of their thought was they had to wait for their soul to catch up with them (laughs) with where they were at in life. And in a lot of ways, it does feel like that's what reflection is doing is it's giving you a chance, honestly, to like catch up with yourself and catch up with the, the meaning and the values you have inside. That's right. That's right. But it's a powerful, it's a really profound book. I would recommend anyone Love to read it. Do you have other things related to reflection that you would yeah. suggest? Yeah. Yeah. There's a book that was written in the 90s called The Power of Full Engagement, written by Tony Swartz and Jim Lore. And these guys used to work with Olympic athletes. And it's the principle of the sprint and the pause. And the principle is that the power to full engagement is not time management, but energy management. So am I aware of what's happening physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? And have I created time and structure to pause long enough in order to put energy in so I have enough to give out? So this is a book called Silence in the Age of Noise by Erling Kage. He is from Oslo, and he, he walked across the North Pole, for example. He's an explorer. He's a philosopher. He's a publisher. And it's a beautiful book on silence and the, the gift of silence and reflection. So I refer that to a number of people. Yeah, I'd highly, highly recommend that one. Okay, so I want to talk about a couple of other things, but maybe just to spend a little bit of time on that subject of renewal and, you know, the idea in that book, The Power of Full Engagement. One of the things that I loved that you we do as part of the life planning process is spend time on what you call the replenishment cycle. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and why that's so important, especially in the context of someone who has felt very foggy, now they have clarity, now they've got connection, but clearly there's a long distance to span between their intention and, and realizing that. How does that replenishment cycle factor into that? Yeah, so a common theme of especially like high capacity leaders that I engage is that I just don't have enough time to take care of myself. Like when 24-7, when it's all said and done, that's going to go, which means health goes physically, there's weight gain, there's high blood pressure, there's whatever else going on physically. And there's oftentimes fatigue mentally. Sleep isn't happening well. There's not rest. The body's not replenishing, which means the mind isn't replenishing, which probably means I'm not managing the reality of my emotions really well. And I'm probably not cultivating what I really value and deeply care about. So those are all signals. So what that means is, is that we've got to like reconstruct our mindset towards self-care and not see it as like this option not see it as this like narcissistic self-indulgent thing I do, but it's actually critical as critical as eating food is to my existence. So there's a mind shift. We kind of have to understand how like I cannot not do these things. So what are those things? Those things and that book, The Powerful Engagement goes deeper sort of into the science of this, but In the powerful engagement, they talk about physical, mental, emotional, spiritual replenishers are investments. And they don't have to be mass amounts of time. They can be thoughtfully weaved through my daily life from morning till night. In life planning, we we say intellectual instead of mental. So we have the acrostic PIES, P-I-E-S, 
physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual. The physical is the easy one. It's like, it's, you know, people work out, they exercise. But so the science behind that is that, you know, there's actually science that says, especially there's a tipping point when you turn 50, that if you don't get your heart rate up to 85% of its maximum capacity for 30 to 45 minutes, four times a week, you're the cellular structure in your human body begins to like go down. But if you do that, like four to five times a week, you actually rebuild cellular structure. So now when I work out, it's not a waste of time. It's like I'm doing this so that I have physical stamina and energy to do other things I want to do. Now I can double up. I can listen to podcasts, audio books, I have 200 hours of Tom Patterson on my phone, or sometimes it's music or, or nothing, you know? But so in those cases, I'm also not just replenishing physically, but I'm replenishing mentally or intellectually. Like I need to have input of good thinking from other people. And that replenishes and stirs up my creative intellectual juices and energy, right? If I go long periods of time without input, I stagnate mentally and intellectually. And on the emotional side, you know, I've learned from like Julia Cameron. Have you read the book, The Artist's Way? No. It's a great, it's sold millions of copies and a lot of artists and like music, lyrical writers. And, but even like people in the sciences and in business leadership, she has a practice called morning pages. And you, first thing you do when you wake up, it's not journaling. It's like brain drain on paper. You write longhand three pages of whatever is in you. It can be emotional, like just dumping. It can be creative thoughts. It can be ordering your day. It can be writing letters to your a child or a spouse, whatever. Whatever is in you gets out. And it's like you're skimming the dross off your brain when you wake up. And for me, that has helped me like deal with my emotional realities and all that's going on inside of me. And then on the spiritual side, that's different for everyone. But in their book, The Powerful Engagement, they define the spiritual as like the the hub or the center within our being where our core values and beliefs reside. And those need to be replenished as well. And those can be done through certainly religious practice if people have that. It can be done through meditation. It can be done through reflection. It can be done through different readings of the ancients, ancient wisdom, stuff like that. So, you know, when we build the replenishment cycle like we did with you, I'm just simply, again, Socratically asking you questions like, what are some things, practices that you've done in the past that you want to maybe restart or keep doing? Things you've always thought you'd like to try that would be replenishing that we need to make visible and, and then some things other things out there that are good ideas that maybe you want to dabble in to see if they really do replenish the point is this it doesn't have to be a long list of stuff like three four maybe five things that i can integrate into the rhythm of my weekly life that if i take enough time and it has, doesn't have to be a lot of time but it has to be strategic carved out time where i am even if I'm raising kids and, you know, and young married and busy, 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 I can take these short pauses in my daily and weekly rhythm. Perfect, perfect encapsulation. You did such a good job, I think, of driving that that home. Because, yeah, I know I've struggled with that. I, I think everyone that has sufficient ambitions and is of a certain age where, you know, there's just so many responsibilities to manage, it finds it hard at times to figure that out. Well, I would say this too, in response to that, Daniel, is that there's a diminishing point of return. So I can work another five hours a week, but if I actually like stop and not do those five hours a week and spend some time replenishing, Mm -hmm. my rate of productivity and output is going to maybe be double full or significantly more. So we have to believe that we need a mindset shift. Mm -hmm that more work isn't necessarily more productivity. And I must have healthy integration in in terms of how I self-lead and self-care for myself, believing if I do that, there will be greater contribution in work. Yep. 
No, and one of the ways that I've thought about that as well, too, is one, it goes back to the point you made of trying to draw the straightest line between two dots. And that's like the I'm going to work five hours approach. And, you know, I think another one that, yeah, I've spent a lot of time thinking about for the last little while is thinking about performance as more like quantum physics where it's multidimensional. I think, like you said, in a lot of ways, the let me work five more hours. That means I got more done this week is super alluring, but it's very short-sighted because it doesn't take into account a bunch of other things like, well, what if you worked half as many hours, but you showed up at 10 out of 10 in terms of focus and intensity during that time? What would that look like? And then there's the other notion as well too, of maybe focusing less on just output or input, which in my mind is like, this is what I got done this week, or this is how much I worked this week. And instead, much more about how did I show up this week? Did I show up as my best self? And, you know, it it was amazing working with you because you, you focus on those things. One idea that we spent a bunch of time on when we worked together that I've shared with others and it's just been really profound for me is this concept of surrendering and and owning. Just to share a little bit of my story, I think something that I had struggled with for a really long time is wanting to do things that felt out of my grasp, that I think it was a mix of imposter syndrome. It was a mix of fear. You know, I think a lot of how our worst selves show up is we're just driven by fear. So you're you're not, not, I want to do this because I don't care about the outcome, but this is a meaningful thing for me to do, but instead flipping it and like, I only want to do this if I know the outcome can be great. And I don't know if the outcome is going to be great. And so then fears taking the wheel, but you know, through the process of working with you, I got in touch with those things in a way that no longer felt surface level that felt like, no, I, I need to do this. This is what I was meant to do. And the concept you shared with me there is, okay, well, when you have a sense for that, what that truth is, then you need to surrender to it. And there's something in my, I don't know what it was. I don't know if I just haven't encountered that before, but there's something so powerful about that of like one, get in touch with those true, those truths that for you and in your life, and then surrender to them. Don't fight them. Don't be afraid of the impo- imposter syndrome. And that to me has just been so profound. And the way that I've used that is, you know, with friends that are going through similar transitions or it feels like the world right now is at a point where everyone is going through some sort of transition. At least that's what it feels like on on different days. But for instance, I have a friend recently who's been in a company for a long time, has finally decided to make the move and start his own thing, obviously has a whole mix of emotions around that. And I shared that principle with him of just like, if this is what you know that you want to do next, then you just don't fight it. You just need to surrender to it. Don't get in your own head about it. And it was amazing because similarly for me in that moment, he was like, wow, that is a profound idea. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe why that shows up in this Patterson process in the first place and and how you share that with people? Yeah, I, I would say that unless you wrestle with the concept of surrender, you will never fully engage and live out and experience the joy of your life purpose on earth. So what does that mean? So surrender, well, I'll say this, every story, including mine and yours and everybody listening, has an antagonist, a bad guy. It's like every great movie we love has a really good bad guy, right? And in the worst case scenarios, that bad guy is like evil, like depicts evil. Well, in our stories, it's it's some form of fear. It can play out as doubt as well or anxiety, but it's the opposition or the opposer or resistor to our story. And so we have to identify those fears. And fear is crafty. Fear is smart. The voice of fear has a lot of forms, a lot of creative applications. And so when you begin to discover your, your life purpose, and what life is inviting and calling you towards and wooing you towards, you can count on the voice of fear, like amping up. It's going to. Why? Why? Because it has one mission in and of itself, and that is to keep you from going down that pathway. So it's almost like fear stands in the doorway, and its job or desire or purpose is to make you go the other way. If we flip it and say, you know what, fear can actually point the way. Now, I'm not talking about jumping off a 60-foot cliff into dry ground. I'm talking about the fear of like discovering 
really what we want out of life and what life wants out of us and going down that pathway, Mm -hmm. fear is going to stand in the doorway to make you not go through that doorway and down that pathway. When in essence, fear points the way and it actually is, if you think about it, you should move towards the doorway and towards the fear in that doorway. And more often than not, in the life work I, I do, people like go towards the fear, confront the fear, bust through the fear, get on the other side of the door and go, what was I so afraid of? I should have done that a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Surrender is the way of life mindset and discipline of being all in and letting go of things I'm not supposed to try to control. And trusting something bigger and greater than myself and confronting the fears that are trying to keep me from going that way. And so practically, what does that mean? Sometimes that means, unfortunately, a common theme is like someone has given decades of their life vocationally to going down a pathway in order to please their parents. Or dad did it, so I'm doing it. That's a common theme. And when someone discovers a different pathway that they were made for, They have to confront that fear of disappointing that voice or figure in their life of authority. But when they're all in and they let go of that, that's there's so much. I've had grown men break down and weep and cry because they never experienced the possibility of like being all in, surrendered to that and letting go of that sense of control Mm -hmm. in order to experience something much greater that they were made for. What are some strategies you employ to help people get over that fear? Like, you know, in my mind, because I, I, I don't know, the, the way it's typically played out for me is when I feel that fear, then I kind of, you know, have a little bit of a conversation with myself. And some of the ways I try to reframe it is when I feel fear, then I need to bet on myself and know that I can rise to the occasion. So that's maybe one, you know, little mental tactic that I use. What are some other things that you suggest? Or maybe I'm totally off and that's not at all what <laughs> what people should be yeah. doing. Uh, I think it's different for everyone. I mean, self-counsel, like you just referenced, like that's why I love that Julia Cameron morning pages. It's like almost self-guided therapy for me. And it's like, I can talk myself off the cliff and identify fear and confront it and and be all in again, re-surrender for the day, that kind of thing. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need something feels bigger than ourselves. And so we, we need an actual therapist. We need a counselor like to deal with fear that is prohibiting me from being fully all in or surrendered to what I know I need to do. Yeah. So if we need to get help, get help. You know, some people like get a life coach. Some people get like a spiritual advisor of some kind depending on what that means for them. So there's a lot of different, you know, ways. We need mentors. I'm in this cool group. There's seven of us. We get together once a month and one person brings a a life question and we talk about it. And oftentimes we're surfacing fears and things we're struggling with and kind of helping each other like address and bust through it. So there's a lot of creative ways we can deal with all that stuff. But It must be thoughtful. And and for me personally, there's, I do some of that myself in my replenishment cycle, but then relationally, I've got to be connected to other people. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be open to get help if we need help. So I want to come back to that question of books. And, you know, the reason is people can't see, but obviously your house is filled with books. You're a prolific, a prolific reader, I think, on on almost every topic. What are some books that have been especially meaningful in your own life? And then what are some, what are like the top handful that will frequently show up when you work with people in a life plan or that you find yourself referring people to again and again and again that just feel like universal good reads for people to read, reflect on, and think about how to incorporate in their own life? Yeah, there's a lot of books. Viktor Frankl has been, I mentioned, very formative in my thinking. He's written over 30 books. He's well known for, most well known for Man's Search for Meaning. I think it sold like 10 million copies. He wrote another book called Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning. It's like a much deeper dive into his logotherapy. And, And I don't recommend that to everybody, but it's certainly formative in my thinking in the space I live in with life planning. Tom Patterson wrote a book, Living the Life You're Meant to Live. 
Certainly the power of full engagement. I mentioned that book earlier on, on the replenishment cycle. There's a lot of great books on story. I don't know if you've read Stephen Pressfield. I love, he's one of my, he's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, The War of Art is a play on the art of war, which is a Chinese book written a couple thousand years ago. But The War of Art, one of his books, is, uh, I think, a great read and form of Julia Cameron, for sure, The Artist's Way. And then she wrote The Right to Write, if you're a writer, and also Walking in This World, just the, the practice of walking in nature and reflecting well are all great reads. Silence in the Age of Noise, I mentioned that one. A lot of business books, I love the Good to Great. Why am I drawing a, a blank on his name? Jim uh, Collins. Jim Collins. Yeah. I could give you a lot of business books that have been formative in my life. All yeah, the, Drucker, the Drucker books, for sure. His book, Management, Drucker's book, Management, Chapter 45, Managing Oneself, is a great chapter on self-leadership. Great leaders lead themselves really well, first and foremost. So those are all very formative reads in my development. We spent most of today talking about life plan. You obviously do that for individuals. You do that as well for couples. And then separately, you do something for companies and businesses called StratOps. Can you spend a little bit of time just setting up what that is? It's like a life plan for an organization. So same principles of gaining perspective, uh, getting clarity out of that clarity, clarifying mission, vision, values, strategies, and out of that building strategic planning systems. So here we, in Stratop, Stratop stands for strategic operating planning process. So strategy is making decisions or thoughtful decisions for tomorrow today, planning for the future today. Operational leadership is managing today to day, like all the realities of today's serving customers and managing personnel and managing processes and systems that make the infrastructure of a company or organization operate. There's a third silent partner called the financial. We must manage the financial truths and realities and invest in the strategic future, but also the operational realities. So you could say it's a strategic operational financial planning system. I say system thoughtfully because most people or businesses do not do not see strategy as a system. They see it as an event. And so here we get all the top leaders together in an organization. We try to get the right chemistry, the right collective IQ. And we go through that same apex of clarity with the group. And in this case, they're guided by process and a facilitator. And we flesh out truth and we create the core plan. And then we, over time, we install that plan as a system and we work the plan as a system. So I have, over the years, you know, a list of business clients. My brother started and owns and built one of his many companies as Otterbox, the brand Otterbox. And in 2006, we installed Stratop. They were 4.2 million a year. And today they're over a billion a year, but we run that company through Stratops. And that's our strategic system on how we, you know, COVID for sure, like, boom, we did a quick Stratop to adjust all the change. And that company is profoundly healthy culturally, but very on point strategically. You know, we'll get, we'll get, it's a global company. So we'll get 25 leaders together once a quarter and we work the plan. And once a year, we, we update and renew it. But they're using that plan day in and day out in the business as a system. So that's how it works. And that's a very high level. But it's we, we look at a company holistically, not as a bucket of parts. We get perspective. We flush out truth. And then we clarify all the strategic pillars, especially the vision, where are we headed, and then we build all the actionables around that. We structure the organization to form follows function. So to make the workflow and move us towards the vision, we set up the management system to work the plan. And then we renew it constantly as change happens, which it does all the time. So we're doing that whole 
process all the time, always getting perspective, moving towards the vision, making sure we're focused on what's important now. Do we have the right structure for the vision? Do we have the discipline and accountability built into making sure the right things are getting done? And are we adapting to change? And then on the life plan, I just want to quickly touch on, I know there's a few ways people can do that. I know there's a self-guided way through a book that people can kind of take themselves through maybe a preliminary or a lighter weight, non-facilitated version of the life plan. Then there's the two days, which I did with you, which was an incredible experience I'd highly recommend. And I believe now you also have an online way for people to do the life plan. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how people should think about those different ways? So we have life plan launch, which is a lower price point, and it's just totally online, self-guided. So I forget how many videos are on there with worksheets you download and you watch and you sort of, you know, self-discover, but it's self-guided. We have one step up from that where you're doing that. You get the book you have, you are watching videos, and then you also tap in on the phone or on Zoom to a facilitator at different times to help you. A little higher price point. And then like the premium price point would be what you did, where you come to a facilitator fly in somewhere where they are in the country and spend multiple days with them and and it's in person. Got it. Thank you so much for all your time and your generosity and just everything we've covered today. We've gone all over the place. You've been super open. So thank you so much, Pete. I really, I really appreciated it. Daniel, it's great being with you. I'm so proud of you and all that you're doing and it's great to be on your podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to anything and everything mentioned in this episode, please go to outliers.fm. If you enjoyed this episode, sign up for my weekly newsletter. You'll be the first to hear about new episodes before they're released, and you'll get the best quotes, themes, and ideas from each episode in a weekly update I call Inside the Episode. To sign up for that, just go to outliers.fm slash newsletter. Just two more things before you take off. Number one, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes. My amazing team and I invest countless hours planning, researching, and editing each episode because we want all of them to be amazing. And we hope you enjoyed listening. If you did, please consider taking 30 seconds to leave a short review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Reviews are crucial in helping us get the best guests and helping more people find outliers. So if you have 30 seconds, please take a moment and leave a short review. Thank you so much. Number two, if you haven't already, sign up for my Friday Five newsletter. Each Friday, you'll get a short email where I share the coolest things that I've been using, loving, and pondering each week. Those include new products I'm trying, supplements I'm experimenting with, people I've been studying, books and articles I've been enjoying, and so much more. It's super short, it's filled with awesome and interesting stuff, and it's a great way to get inspired each week as you head into the weekend. To get access, go to friday5.email. That's F-R-I-D-A-Y-F-I-V-E dot email. Thank you so much. Thank you.